This video is sponsored by Squarespace, your one-stop shop for creating and managing your own online brand. But more about that later in the video. Hello everybody, glad you could make it. My name is Kaylee Ellen and welcome to this week's video. I've wanted to make this video for the longest time you cannot imagine. Today's video, as you may guess from the title, is a bit more of a sit down and talking kind of video. There will be lots of tips, there will be lots of information in it, so it's not completely useless. But as you can see, I am in front of my green screen. So what is this video about today? You know what? I'm having an energy drink because we have so much to talk about. I'm not gonna get through this without a drink. I don't know where my regular straws are. Just go with it, it's a vibe. So on this channel, I get asked for care tips, care advice, either on a general plant or a specific plant. I get asked all the time. And it's a very valid question. I get it. I'm a plant YouTuber. I should probably be giving out care tips, right? I do have a couple of care videos that I've made. I think I have one on Calathea, which was my first. I have Alocasia and then I have Philodendron. Those are general care videos and people do tell me they find them very helpful. So if any of those interest you, I will leave them down below. But today's video is a little bit different. I've all but stopped making those kinds of videos, if I'm totally honest, and I want the reasons that I talk about today to make sense, so hopefully they will. And really, if you were looking for a video, a care video, or whatever, on a certain type of plant, this is kind of the video you come to first before you even look up care tips for any plant online. That doesn't have to be a video, by the way, that could be articles, could be anything you like. I want this video to be the video that you see first so you get a really good understanding of a lot of the stuff that I talk about in this video. I feel like most of what I'm going to say is often overlooked and this does apply to all houseplants. It doesn't just have to be aroids, so if you're thinking it's just aroids, you'd be wrong. This applies to literally any House plant. So what does the average internet article or garden tag say about plant care? I think it's pretty easy to sum that up nowadays. Now I'm not saying every website doesn't go into detail, but most of them probably cover the following. They will likely cover watering, which is basically when to water. The best case scenario here is that they will probably tell you when to water your substrate based on how dry it is. Worst case scenario, they'll tell you to do it once a week or something similar. Literally worst case. They might talk about feeding, so when to feed. Sometimes they will mention the type of fertilizer to use, i.e. what is the NPK of the fertilizer, what does the plant prefer. They're probably going to talk about light, even though it's absolutely useless because it's always bright indirect, so who cares anyway? We're left to kind of figure that out. They may also mention the substrate you should use, i.e. it probably says a well-draining mix. Well, that's very useful, isn't it? Now I know, it's a minefield, right? Because we have all these different houseplants and apparently they need different care, except all of the generic advice you get seems to be the same care. But we can't always put our finger on why it's so difficult and why it's a minefield. So the things we're going to talk about in this video and the things that I think personally are very important and very relevant to a plant's care are as follows. So we have the same for that the generic advice gives. So we have watering, feeding, light. Light isn't that simple because when the light changes, we might water less. Substrate, which is like a whole other thing, literally. But I also include some other things that I think important here, like for example, humidity. What humidity do we have in our growing environment and are we doing anything to maintain it or are we just rolling with what we have? You gotta consider the temperature as well. And I must tell you now that humidity and temperature are actually linked. So that's something to consider. There is the small matter of pests, which they're not a small matter, but for the purposes of this video, they are. We're gonna talk about the pot because the pot means everything. The pot can change everything. Believe me, guys, I know you might think it doesn't, but it really, really, really does. The difference between one pot to another can have a plant either thriving or just dead. We're going to talk about roots. So the type of roots and the root mass. Yes, really. We're also going to very, very, very briefly cover airflow because some plants like it, some plants don't. It really depends. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so we get that you don't really love all the stuff that houseplant articles write online or a lot of things that maybe some influencers tell you or whatever else. We get it. You don't like it. You're not happy with it. It's too generic. 
but you've just given us a list of things you're going to talk about. So why can't you just do this for a given plant? Why can't you do it? Now, the reason I don't tend to make care videos on, a, say, a given plant because of the reason that every single website has ever left out and most videos and most anything else you see online, it is something that is absolutely crucial to your plant's care that they leave out. And it's not on that list so far. So what is it? The one factor that when anybody gives care tips, the one thing that they could not possibly know or work out is what I call the 11th factor. And that factor that is affecting your plant's care the most is you. We're always looking for care tips on the internet for plants, whether that be videos, articles, whatever. But what we don't often consider is what we are like as growers, what we are like as plant parents, if you will. What is your lifestyle? How many plants do you aspire to have? Are they in one place or are they all around the house? Are you an overwaterer or an underwaterer? If so, to what extent? I.e., if you're an underwaterer, do you wait till your plants are positively wilting? Or are you testing the soil every now and again and you're just catching it a little bit on the dry side or maybe a couple of days past watering? These things make a big difference. These things aren't a case of A or B. It's a sliding scale. What does easy plant care mean to you? Are you at home a lot and you have the time to take care of houseplants of literally any difficulty? Does that in itself make it easy for you to look after houseplants simply because you have the time? Does that make a plant easy because you have the time to look after it? Do you like to prune or propagate your plants? Does that come into whether a plant is easy or not? Would you prefer plants that just pop by themselves, e.g. an alocasia? Or do you prefer slow growers where you don't even have to worry about either of those things very often? How much time do you want to spend looking after your plants, you know? Do you want something that is absolutely hardy and can take care of itself and hold its own? Or do you want a plant that you have to baby. Can you be bothered to feed your plants? Or do you want it built into your substrate? Are you prepared to provide extra humidity or not? What is an acceptable humidity to you? For example, I know that the plants in my shop enjoy a good 75 to 80% humidity, but it's not acceptable for my house. My perfect humidity in my house is probably going to be 55 to 60%. So what is an easy plant in my plant shop could now be a hard plant in my home environment. It's really good to take notice of your plants and answer these questions yourself and keep a note of them because this is going to help you massively when you're buying plants as you might decide, hey, I'm not really prepared to do what it takes to keep this plant looking Instagram worthy if I buy it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, by the way. If you can choose plants that fit your care style and it's forgiving from things like underwatering, overwatering, then great. If you have low humidity on your house, then choose plants that are going to be okay in that. And you will have a much better time. So I now want to go through that list that I gave you at the start that I think is important for plant care. I'm going to go through each point and I'm going to tell you what I feel that every other care tip, website, video, whatever, tends to leave out because I think they're important and again nobody really talks about this stuff. If you're looking for an easy way to build and run your own website then look no further than Squarespace. Squarespace is your one-stop shop to create your own website from the ground up using a selection of stylish and super customizable templates. I love how I can create a really cohesive theme across my website without much effort at all. By using the site styles panel I can customize how I want all of my fonts and buttons to look across the entire website as well as the color scheme. So basically any change I make in here is reflected reflected across the whole website instantly. If you want to create a really sleek looking website either for yourself or perhaps you're setting up a web shop like mine, check out squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch go to squarespace.com forward slash Kaylee Ellen to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's it for voiceover Kaylee, back to the video. So the first thing we're going to cover is watering and watering is obviously the number one thing that anyone alive wants to know when it comes to plant care. Even people that aren't that into house plants still want to know how often do I water my plant and the answer is I don't know because it depends on so many things. Watering depends on so many factors, including temperature, humidity, light, substrate, root mass, you, of course, as we've talked about. Basically, nearly everything else depends on watering and vice versa. 
This is why when I talk about a plant when I make my videos, I will make a passing comment about a plant and I'll be like, oh, this plant can tolerate being underwatered. This plant can tolerate being overwatered. They tend to not need too much. This is why I say it. I never tell you how often to do something because how could I possibly know what kind of water you are? Are you underwatering? Are you overwatering? What's your humidity like? What's your pot like? What's your substrate like? I couldn't possibly know. And that is why I don't tell you things like that on my videos. As far as light goes when it comes to its relationship with watering, if you are in the winter time and there is less light, I promise you the amount you're watering your plant is going to drastically decrease. You should really, really notice it. So therefore the care tip of watering once every week is already out the window, right? If you recently repotted your plant, the ratio of root mass to substrate is now at more of an imbalance than it was before. So you're probably going to water less, right? Because the surrounding substrate could be too wet for the plant because there's more of it than what there was before. And that substrate, no matter what type of substrate it is, now has the ability to hold on to more water. So when you repot your plant, you risk overwatering it. Just please, when it comes to watering, do not listen to anybody or anything that tells you, you know, water this plant once a week. Because I'm telling you now, you will end up killing your plant at some point if you don't have a good handle on how to take care of plants yourself and do it more intuitively. You will absolutely kill your plant. This advice does not take into account whether you're an underwaterer, an overwaterer, or anything else. Let's talk about feeding or fertilizer. So if I say feeding, what I mean is I'm fertilizing the plant. A few people got confused when I said that a while ago. So feeding depends on both light and substrate and temperature and other things, but we're going to summarize it down. We're going to condense it to light and substrate. Now, during the growing season, the plant is growing more generally, so you're probably going to have to feed more often. Compare that with winter when you're getting less light. Some people like to not feed at all. I know I used to back in the day, but now I do feed. I definitely feed all year round because at least in my shop, I'm simulating an all year round constant condition. So I have no need to drop my feed in the winter months, but you probably may need to because believe me, the plant is not going to grow as much in winter if you are not full on simulating summer conditions. Not only that, but depending on your substrate, the type of feed and how often you feed and the way you feed might completely change. And this depends on whether you're using like a soil mix or you're using a semi-hydro substrate like Lekka or something like that. That could change things completely and completely throw you off. Not only that, but if you have a slow release fertilizer in your soil, then that could change absolutely everything. You may not need to feed anywhere near as much. And if you do feed, you risk killing the plant because you risk over fertilization, which can burn the roots and it's not pretty and you don't want it. Personally, I don't like to put slow release in my substrates. I've tried it before and I didn't like it at all. I prefer to have clean substrate without any real fertilizer in it. And I just feed myself. I prefer to do that. I know where I'm at with it. I know what the plants are getting and what they aren't getting. It's more on me, fine, but it's just how I prefer to be. Let's talk about light. So, bright indirect, what the hell? Are you working with natural light or are you working with artificial light? Bright indirect light doesn't really mean too much, if I'm honest. I like to bin it out the way completely and just do low, medium, high light because at least the plants that I work with don't need full sun. So if you want to know what bright indirect is, it's a bright spot with no direct sun on it. That's what indirect light means. And obviously bright means bright. That's the best I can give you in five seconds. If you're using artificial light, you've got to think about wavelengths of lights, the temperature of the lights, how long you leave them on for, everything else, maybe the heat they give off, maybe that might change something. Now, I'm not going to go into grow lights in this video because honestly, it would be five hours long, so we're not going to do that. I will make a separate video for that at some point. But as I've mentioned before, light obviously differs from certain times of the year. So light in summer is probably not the same as the light in winter. In fact, the light in winter, as we all know, is pretty crappy. So you might be moving your plants around your house. You might be grouping them in winter. You might be doing something else. So I can tell you this plant needs bright and direct light. But does it really, really have any translation? No, not really. Ah, substrate. So as I mentioned before, substrate is a whole other thing. It is a whole other thing. It is a whole other video. And honestly, it's so much more important than what anybody makes it out to be, like tenfold. Now there are infinite types of substrate because each substrate can be somebody's custom mix. So what I'm going to talk about today when I talk about two different types of substrate, I'm going to talk about like a chunky aroid mix. I'm not really going to tell you what it contains. It doesn't matter. I'm just referring to it in a general sense. So a soil type mix versus a semi-hydro mix, which we're going to use Lekka as an example. 
So a custom potting mix may have orchid bark, different variations of coir, a small amount of regular potting mix, which is the really nasty shit that you probably shouldn't really use unless you're just trying to moisten some soil up. Some perlite, some pumice maybe, some moss. Really it could be anything because it's your custom mix and hopefully you've made one that works for you and I'll get into that in just one moment. Lecker, on the other hand, stands for Lightweight Expanded Clay Aggregate. It basically looks like Maltese's chocolate without any of the nutritional value or any of the fun if you stand on it. Many people like this substrate because it's not messy, it's reusable with a rinse or so, and it allows more oxygen to get to the roots, encouraging better root health. And generally, roots, in my experience anyway, are a lot quicker growing when they're in Lekka. I use Lekka all the time in my shop. If you bought from my shop or you've seen enough of my videos, you'll know that I pretty much predominantly use Lekka. It has a lot of advantages to me as a business as well but we don't need to go into those. You can use whatever substrate works for you, but what I will say is I advise you not to go for something like Lekka if you are in an environment with less than 50% humidity because the upkeep of keeping that Lekka moist is probably going to be quite a bit and you run the risk of your roots drying out. And once your roots have dried out too much and you wet them again, you're probably gonna get rot. I've said this a lot in my videos, that's just what happens. So if you are in a low humidity situation, I know that Lekka might look fun and clean and non-messy, but you might want to go for a soil type mix because the water loss from that soil is going to be a lot slower and your plant might be a lot healthier. You might find it a lot easier. So when you create your aroid mix and emphasis on your, remember that extra factor that nobody talks about is you. So when you create your aroid mix, whether it be using someone else as a guideline or not, please consider the amount of humidity that you have in your home and how you generally are with plants. Are you an overwaterer or are you an underwaterer? For example, if my house sits at 60% humidity and I'm an overwaterer, I'm probably going to make sure that my soil has a slightly increased ability to dry out, but not too much. Just because I know I'm always busy and if I postpone watering, can the plant handle it? If I make it too drying, then no, I'm probably going to tip the needle a little bit too far. If you're in, say, 40% humidity and you are an underwaterer, please make sure that whatever mix you're using, if you've been given it off the internet, try and make sure that it has enough moisture in it to work for you because you know that you're not going to water the plant as much and you know that that substrate is probably going to dry out a bit quicker in your environment. So if you can add a little bit of something extra, whether it's moss, coir, something like that, if you can just make it that little bit more moist to tailor it to you, then that is going to work a lot better for you. Yes, I said moist. I'm not suggesting that you'll find the perfect mix for you straight away. By the way, you might have to experiment. So maybe if you're trying a new mix out, don't plant everything in it. Maybe do a smaller batch, test it. If you're planting up cuttings, great time to slightly adjust the amount of the ingredients in each part of the mix for your plants. And then you can see what works the best for you in whatever part of the house you're in as well. Because that's also a bit of a factor without getting too granular. Whatever you do, just adjust the mix you've been given so that it works for you. That is the golden rule. Make sure it works for you. If you don't intend on feeding all the time, maybe this is the time to add in a little bit of slow release fertilizer as well. Whether that be something like worm castings, which is kind of like a natural alternative, that's basically worm poop, or you can add in an actual slow release fertilizer. That will help you massively if you either don't tend to feed at all or you don't often feed and you're very lazy with it. Maybe this is a good time to add it in. Again, semi-hydro, things like Lekka, you're probably going to have to be relied upon solely to feed your plants. So that is a decision as well. In summary, when you choose a substrate for your plant, no matter what any video or article or whatever says to you, tailor it to both your environment and your watering style and you will find your plant care a hell of a lot easier. You might see someone with a beautiful soil mix on Instagram or orchid bark and some moss or whatever it is. It's working absolutely fantastic for them, but it might not work for you. And that doesn't just mean your environment, your temperature. It means you yourself. It depends whether you occasionally have a busy week. Do you have consistent weeks? Do you enjoy feeding? Do you not enjoy feeding? Do things just dry out more? Do they not? Perhaps you've got a humid environment, but you've got grow lights on in a tent and it's going to dry the moss out and things are just going to go <laughs> so what works for one person online might not work for you please 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 tailor any mix any mix i don't care what it is on the internet tailor it to you use it as a guideline literally the recipe is more like a guideline than an actual rule the code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules
Let's talk about humidity really quickly. So I honestly don't think, personally, you can commit to plant care without knowing what humidity you have. And I do suggest using something like a hygrometer to monitor it so you actually know what's going on because what you will find if you're not supplementing your humidity, that will fluctuate a lot, either throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the seasons, or whether you've just decided to put the heating on or whether you've decided to dry some washing indoors. I tell you now, humidity will vary a lot. If you don't monitor your humidity at all, you might not be aware of the fact that during winter, your humidity can go down to like 10 or 20% which is insane, but it can happen because central heating is a bitch, guys. It is a bitch and we all need it. Our plants, however, could do without it. This is why a lot of people, whether they plant newbies or maybe they just they haven't had this happen before, a lot of people can get crispy leaves in winter. That's usually why. If you see crispy leaves in winter and you don't think it's a watering issue, highly likely to be a humidity issue. And it's probably central heating. Let's talk about temperature. Now, temperature is probably going to dictate the speed of growth of your plants. And I would actually say that's about as important as light is when it comes to growth. You wouldn't think it, but it honestly is. You might have noticed, at least I have in the UK, when you get a heat wave, providing it's not too much. So say we're having a day in the UK where that's like 28 degrees Celsius, maybe a bit less, maybe even 25. If it lasts for a weekend, your plants will probably grow a good inch in that weekend. Okay, temperature makes a huge, huge difference to the speed of growth of your plants. Unfortunately, though, it also influences something called transpiration, which is basically the water loss through the leaves as a result of pulling it up through the substrate. So not only does that come into it, but of course, general evaporation of the water from the soil, the lecker, whatever. In higher temperatures, if you're not doing something about your humidity, that can happen as well. So be really, really careful. Honestly, guys, generally speaking, though, only consider the temperature on a granular level if you are growing your houseplants outdoors, because I know, obviously, in the US, a lot of people do, or other countries, you know, Philippines, Peru, wherever, a lot of you do. Obviously, I'm in the UK, we don't. But what I don't understand is I get so many people saying, oh, I'm in zone five, I can't grow this, I can't grow that. I don't know why that's a problem. Being in zone five doesn't matter too much if you're growing indoors. Will it have a slight influence? Yes, maybe but generally not too much. For example, I'm in the UK. I think I'm zone eight or nine. I grow my plants just fine. They're in the house. They're not outside. As long as I do, you know, the minimum to keep things kind of okay for the plant, the plant's absolutely fine. Honestly, please don't worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Only consider the temperature of your growing environment. Nothing else. I don't care what it's like outside unless you are growing your plants outside. For the sake of this video, okay, I don't care. The only time where temperature and the temperature outside matters is if, as before I discussed, if you're putting your heating on in winter because the temperature will go up but the humidity is going to go down. So that is something to consider. Obviously, the inverse of that would be in summer, if you put aircon on, that also dries the air out. So that's the only time, in my opinion, if you are growing plants indoors where the temperature outside should have some influence on your plants but it's not really going to influence it in the way that you would think. Does that make sense? Let's talk about pests. Now I'm not going to cover all of them in this video, I'm not even going to cover any of them in this video because in my opinion it's a whole separate video because there's so many different types of pests affecting so many different types of plants with so many different treatments. Okay, I just wanted to mention that certain plants are more prone to certain pests than others. And it's just something in a very general sense to be aware about. For example, when it comes to the humble spider mite. Plants with velvety leaves, say Philodendra gloriosum or something like that, tend to suffer a lot more. As well as plants with very thin leaves, like a lot of Calathea have a problem with spider mites. Very, very easy to catch them. However, things like Monstera with more tougher, waxier leaves are a lot less prone to getting them. Does that mean they can't get them? No, of course not. I've had them. It just takes some doing to get them. You know what I mean? They've got a lot more stopping power than what some other plants have. And it's just something generally to be aware of. So if you're wanting to add like a Calathea or something to a corner where you've got some really expensive, bougie Philodendron that are all velvety, maybe just be very careful because that Calathea is probably going to catch the spider mites before the Philodendron do because it's very thin, a lot of them anyway, and you might have a problem. So just an FYI, the pot. The pot. You're probably thinking, the pot? Yes, the pot. Different pots are going to have 
different effects on your plants. Yes, really. And that is both on their own and in connection with your substrate, okay? So they can affect it on their own, they can affect it in combination with whatever substrate you picked for your plant. So the best way to get around the whole pot situation is to figure out what is important to you. Again, that factor that nobody talks about. Is it important that you have regular pots inside cute little, you know, artisan outer pots? Is that something you enjoy? Is that your vibe? Is that what you need? Maybe for your aesthetic or your style of care, you want terracotta pots because you're an overwaterer and the terracotta helps, I don't know, release the extra water because that is a pro of terracotta pots, by the way, if you need to know. There you go. Do you have a busy life? Do you travel a lot? Do you work long shifts? Can you not maybe take care of your plants as often? Perhaps your mental health is suffering at the moment and you just can't feed and water all the plants. It's just too much of a task for you to feel that you can achieve. Because if that's the case, maybe you should consider a self-watering pot. And I think now the days are gone when people would turn their nose up at them. I know it used to happen when I started using them. Those days are gone. People love self-watering pots now. I use them all the time, guys. All the time. I probably use them too much. Nearly any plant I have, it's in self-watering. And any plant I bring into my house, it's going to be self-watering. You don't have to pick a self-watering pot, of course. You can go with whatever you like. You can go with the nursery pot inside the catch pot. You can do terracotta. You can do something else. That's absolutely fine. But whatever pot you choose, please try not to pick a pot that is more than two inches in diameter larger than your root mass. Not the size of the plant. I don't care how big your plant is. I care about the root mass. When I talk about the root mass, I basically mean if you could look at your roots and make a metaphorical ball out of them like that, without squishing them of course, just keeping them like that, how big is your pot compared to that? I don't care if you have a root ball like this and an absolute tree up there. I don't care. I care about this ball right here. So absolutely disregard everything above the surface and just look at that. If you are an overwaterer, I would suggest you only go an inch bigger, maybe even less than that. Really, it depends on what kind of person you are when you take care of your plants. If you're an underwaterer, you can probably go for a couple of inches bigger because the soil is going to hold more. You're probably going to go longer between waterings and it's going to work for you. Of course, the substrate also matters. So if you're choosing a pot that's larger but it's terracotta, it's still going to lose some water, so you need to just bear that in mind. Also, for example, say you have a really dry soil and you shove that in terracotta, that's going to get even drier, so what are you going to do with your pots? It's not as complicated as it sounds, guys, and I'm sorry for making it seem complicated. It's just something to bear in mind. In terms of the type of roots, not all roots are created equal. Believe me, not all roots are created equal. For example, anthurium have really, really thick tuberous roots, but as a result, they can handle being underwater a hell of a lot more. A hell of a lot more. Just by their nature, they can, because they've got nice big fat roots. There are a lot of other plants, like for example, a lot of philodendron, as it happens, that have really thin hairline roots, and that can mean that they absolutely cannot tolerate underwatering, because they're so thin, if they dry out, they are done. And the reason why it annoys me that no one puts this in their plant care is because the type of roots influence how often you will have to care for your plant, how often you will need to water your plant, the type of substrate, everything. So just a super quick note on airflow. Really, this is just an FYI, but some plants love it, some plants kind of hate it. For example, if you've ever owned, well, really any Calathea, you might know that they hate drafts. If you didn't know they hated drafts and your plant is sat in a drafty area, maybe it's being trafficked near a door or it's near an open window and it looks really shit, maybe move it from there because they absolutely hate drafts. And yes, I am counting drafts as airflow. Other plants, however, absolutely love airflow. Not necessarily drafts, some don't care. Like Monstera doesn't really care, for example, Monstera deliciosa. But a lot of plants love airflow to the point where if you gave them a fan, they'd be 10 times happier because it fights other things like mold, bacteria, fungus, things like that. So a lot of anthuriums really like a lot of airflow. Again, really don't concern yourself too much with this one. It's just something to have in the back of your mind if you notice your plant isn't doing well and you've followed all those care instructions on your Calathea and you think, why does it look terrible? That might be why. Before I go, I have some final tips for you that I want you to consider in this video. If you are taking care tips from a plant influencer, doesn't matter who it is, if it's on Instagram, YouTube, could be me, could be anybody, find out what kind of plant carer they are. Not you, but what kind of plant carer they are. 
and their conditions. Because when they say a plant can take underwatering, they may be in 80% humidity and not taking that into account. They may be using terracotta pots or they might keep plants pot bound, i.e. there is more root there than soil, so the plant needs a lot of water. Or are there plants in a really wet mix because they know they're an underwater, so their mix is super wet and it can take underwatering. If you see someone giving care tips, it can be me, it can be literally anybody, do not be afraid to ask them what kind of plant carer they are. You know, how often do they have to look after after their plants. Don't make it too personal, obviously, but you know, like what kind of substrate do they use? Everything else like that. Are they over? Are they under watering? Do they have self-watering plants? Like what is their situation? I guarantee you, everyone will be happy to tell you. Everyone will be happy to tell you. Do not be afraid to ask. It's probably going to help you tailor what their advice is to you. My next major tip, major, 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 major tip, and it's the whole purpose of this video, and that is if your lifestyle or your care style changes, do not be afraid to tailor your plants, your substrate, your pots, where they are in the house, anything. Do not be afraid to tailor that to your new situation. We change so many things in our lives, okay? We change so many things. We change our clothes. We change our diets. We change our jobs. We change our cars. We change so many things. There is nothing wrong with changing the way you care for your plants, how your plants are, or anything else. It's pretty normal, right, when you really think about it that way. If you have a change in circumstance, which could be anything, change your plant care to suit your new situation. Don't struggle trying to do it the way you used to and be feeling really sad because, you know, you have all these beautiful terracotta pots but you don't have time anymore and it's not giving you joy anymore. There is a fix for it. It's not going to fix everything. It depends on what your issue with your plants is, but there is a sort of fix for it. Just tailor it to you. You know, back before I had my channel, I used to be a major, major overwaterer, right? Major. Just I would drown a plant real quick. I worked a nine to five job, but when I came home, I didn't really do much. I just sat there, watched TV all night, and I had plenty of, you know, time to take care of my plants. I actually had a ton of plants. They were all in nursery pots with cute little outer pots, because that was my vibe. That's what I wanted to do. But now I've changed all that. Why? Because my life is completely not even remotely the same as what it was. I quit my job. I work all the time. I'm not always in the house. And when I am, I'm absolutely knackered. So all my plants are in self-watering pots. They're also in a substrate called Pon, made by a brand called Lechuza. It's a bit like Lekka, only it's smaller and it's more granulated and it's got a bunch of different stuff in it, which just keeps the soil wetter than AJ Lekka. Lekka won't work in my household environment. And in my last place, I actually stood my plants all in one corner. That's how much things had changed from how they were before. But I was still able to take care of my plants. They still looked great and they still made me happy. But I changed literally everything. I changed the substrate out, I changed the type of pots, I changed where I put them everything. I didn't even use humidifiers anymore, guys. I didn't even use humidifiers anymore. I just thought, no, I need a minimum effort solution. And I changed it. And it helped me keep plants. And it helped me be happy with the plants I had. And now I had to go around and water them all with the same jug, the same feed once a week because I kept plants that could just take the same conditions. You know, I changed everything about my collection and I'm happier for it. Do not be afraid to change aspects of your plant care to better suit your changing lifestyle. Number one tip. Perhaps you're unable to care for your plants in the way that maybe you used to, like what I mentioned, either due to travel, due to work commitments, maybe you're suffering from an injury, or maybe, of course, you just don't feel like your best self right now and you can't physically commit the energy to looking after them, which is, of course, it happens to all of us, guys. Get some self-watering pots, group the plants together to increase the humidity, make them, you know, more easy to water because you only have to go to one place, you don't have to traipse around your house. Perhaps even downsize your collection if it's overwhelming. And I don't know why people aren't more accepting of this in the plant world, and I think it's really, really important. If, if something does not make you happy anymore, change it. If it's not working for you, tailor it. If something, even if it's plants, become a source of stress, why keep it the way it is? Why keep it the way it is? The number one thing I would like you to consider before caring for any of your plants is you. I really do hope that you find this video helpful, guys. And I always do this on care videos. I mean, I do it on every video, but care videos specifically, we're going to call this video a care video. But I like to leave the comment section open, obviously for any opinions you guys might have. But if you guys have any advice for, you know, pots, self-warring pots, maybe you want to talk about lecker and what works for you, please just put your conditions down if you feel comfortable doing that and exchange tips because that's why we're all here, right? We're all here to try and learn from each other. But remember, when you see a tip from someone, go, okay, they have this. How does that work for me? Will that work for me? What can I do differently to make that work for me? Because it doesn't have to be that you can't have a certain plant. 
if you're able to manipulate some of the conditions, because it doesn't always work, don't get me wrong, but you might be able to manipulate certain conditions in order for you to have healthier plants, maybe the plant that you want, maybe downsize your plants, maybe change your space up. There are so many things that you can do to tailor your situation. Don't look at what anybody else is doing. Do what works for you. I really hope this video is not a jumbled mess because I haven't edited it yet, but I hope it wasn't a jumbled mess and I hope that you understand some of the things I'm trying to say and this is in a nutshell why I don't do care videos. It's not that I will never do them, it's just I can't really say all this in relation to one plant because again it leaves out that one key factor and that is you and that's one thing I could never tailor for because you're all unique and I couldn't possibly, can you imagine? But I hope you found this video useful anyway. If you want any of the other the care videos I've done. For example, I've done one on my aroid mix, which is borderline the same. I haven't used it in a while, so I will be updating that soon. I have the aroid mix video. I have the care videos I mentioned. Anything that I think is of value to you, I will link down below. If you like this video, please do give me a thumbs up. It lets me know that I'm making content that is good for you and that you find it useful and enjoyable. And if you are new to this channel or you're not already subscribed, I would absolutely love it if you could join the family. We're growing here every day and it'd be great to have you with us. Here are my socials down below. I am on them. I'm not on Instagram so much, but I'm definitely on Twitter. I don't know why I'm on Twitter so much. I don't, I just, I don't know. I'm usually complaining about something. So if that's not your thing, then maybe don't follow it. But anyway, thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.